So uh, for reference, I've, uh, for those of you who don't know, I've been here uh, almost a year in Maryland. Um, and so um, one of the, uh, the things that I'm very pleased of moving to Maryland is um, our next speaker, who I will introduce, uh, Mimi, Mimi Narion. Uh, she's in the D.C. area, so uh, lots of great connections here. But without further ado, uh, what I wanted to do is today talk about this intersection that is uh, gaining, I guess, greater currency in a lot of the discussions that's happening in historic preservation, this intersection about historic places and health, physical health, but also mental health and well-being. And this really relates just to overall quality of life issues. And so what I'm really excited about in historic preservation is looking at these kinds of issues it gives us, I think, some really potentially powerful tools to make arguments that are much more powerful than we have before. It's a much uh, bigger difference to say, you know, we should do historic preservation because it's good for us or, you know, it, you know, it, great, it was a great, you know, enhances our sense of place and to actually point to some sort of empirical study and say, look, this is the evidence that this improves or changes people's, people's psychological health. So, but uh, one of the first things I want to uh, make very clear that when I'm talking about historic places, I'm talking about very specific kinds of places that's different than perhaps what some of you might be thinking. Because traditionally where historic preservation practice has focused on is, I'll, I'll call it a history with a capital H. It's the officially sanctioned, authorized history that is you know, listing a building, either on the National Register of Historic Places or local register or state register. So it's gone through some sort of an official process. And so where we've been with that is you know, ancient monuments, uh, monumental buildings. Um, you know, this is, this is downtown Fort Collins, by the way, the prototype for Wizard <laughs> Land. Um, these really, really great buildings like, say, in Nantucket, um, or you know, these fantastic neoclassical buildings that we have all over the country, or you know, really, really high-style residential buildings. Uh, this is where historic preservation has been, and we're trying to move away from this. But you need to keep in mind that in the average person's uh, perspective, this is still historic preservation today. And so it's a, a stereotype that is wrapped around this. What I'm talking about, though, is I use a little bit more of a generic term, old places. So these are places that are meaningful, that are older. So there's obviously some age to that. But they're meaningful to everyday people, not necessarily experts that are officially declaring this is definitely an historic place. And so these are kind of ordinary places, maybe a little bit ugly. Um, you know, you open your front door, and these, these are some of the, the, the kinds of places that you see. Well, certainly they might have some nice aesthetic qualities to it. But clearly, these are different kinds of places. Um, in more of an academic parlance, we might call these vernacular places, the everyday places but obviously meaningful to people, often because of their age. So and we also can throw in there uh, this intersection between nature and cultural. Cultural landscapes that have lots of natural aspects that blend together, that enhance that perception of age and quality that uh, people like. So I wanted to review some of the research that's been done uh, recently on uh, mental health, environmental psychology, and the older built environment. So this is very new work. This is an area of research that has really only been um, uh, approached in the, the last couple of decades, really more or less in the 21st century. Um, so there's a lot of places we can explore here. And this is why I like doing work in this area. I think it's exciting. It's sort of like the, the undiscovered road or the undiscovered territory, however you might want to phrase that. And so I'm going to start a little bit with some of the work that I do um, in terms of uh, understanding how people are affected by the age of place through patina. So, and I go back to John Ruskin because those of you, I mean, I think everybody here probably knows, who, who here doesn't know who John Ruskin is? Yeah, I think, I mean, this is, I'm talking to people who know who this person is. One of the things that really gets overlooked, I think, um, in terms of his writings is uh, th this quality of age value how the decay of the built environment mentally, emotionally impacts, specifically John Ruskin. So lots of emotional um, pleas to the quality of, specifically, Gothic cathedrals and how they affect him. 
um, emotionally. I mean, when he's talking about how these Gothic cathedrals generate a feeling of mixed melancholy, he's talking about emotional states. When he talks about the passing waves of humanity, how people have somehow left an imprint on the physical fabric of the buildings, they've changed these buildings physically, but they've left an imprint through the patina and the age. Again, it's an emotional effect. It's like he can feel the presence of the people there through the way it is evidence to patina. And he has a wonderful phrase for this. At least I think it's wonderful. It's pretty cool because it puts a very specific value on how important he thinks patina is on these buildings. He calls it the golden stain of time. It's really, really, really valuable. And so it's important to try and articulate when you're talking about patina, decay, there's these different terms that we use, how much patina, how much decay? And this is a really, really, really <laughs> open question, and a fascinating one. Of course, I think needs a lot more research. But we know that patina has both a positive and a negative effect on people. If there's the right amount of patina, it can enhance an emotional attachment to place. If there's too much patina or not the right kind of patina, it can look old and dirty, and we want to kind of get away from it because it's kind of yucky. We don't know where, the, where those fine lines are. But we do know that there's sort of this middle range here, that if you have an environment where everything is new in it, you know it's new because it's ordered, it's regular, uh, there's certainly no decaying in it. On the other end of the spectrum, so I'm looking here off to the right, if you have an environment that has things that are incredibly old, incredibly ancient, lots and lots of decay, you essentially have piles of dust, which are incredibly chaotic, incredibly disordered, and incredibly impossible to read. You don't know what it is. So I'm talking about this hypothetical middle state where you've introduced a greater amount of complexity to the built environment through decay, decay and patina, but not so much that you still can't read it. You can still certainly read that there are buildings there as well as you know, maybe artistic intent and some other qualities to that, but it's that middle ground that I'm specifically talking about in this, this research uh, that I'm explaining. And one of the ways I thought, you know, if you wanted to understand what is the difference in people's experiences of an old place and a new place? Wouldn't it be fantastic if you could actually have both of those actually existing together at the same time? Or you could have an, a new and an old environment where the physical, the physical design of both places are pretty much identical. Not only the architectural styles, but uh, the urban design, density, building setback. But the only difference is the age of the two places. And I actually found two of these places to do this comparison with. Uh, this happens to be in the Charleston, South Carolina area. So I compared what I called an authentically old place, which is a historic Charleston south of Broad Street, which is, also happens to be the location of the nation's first local historic district established in 1931. And I compared that against a new urbanist development, which uses techniques for neo-traditional design Basically, the developer, who I talked to quite extensively in this research, was very honest in saying he copied as much as he could, as much as the zoning code would allow him. He copied historic Charleston. That was his intent. And so ION, which is the name of this new urbanist development, has incredibly similar design characteristics, characteristics, aesthetic characteristics as historic Charleston, but it's certainly not nearly as old. And so, so my, my hypothetical Assumption here is that if I take away the new environment from the old environment, what's left has to have, in terms of people's experiences, what's left has to have something to do with this thing we call age value. And to give you a sense of how close these environments are, historic Charleston and this new urbanist development of Ion, I'm going to show you a series of three slides. Exactly half of the slides are from historic Charleston on each, right? It, half of the pictures are from historic Charleston, half of the pictures are from Ion. And I'm going to show you these three slides, and I'm going to ask you what you think is the pattern, is a regular pattern, which are the old uh, authentic places, historic Charleston, and what is the new place, Ion. So this is the first slide. This is the second slide. And this is the last slide. Anybody want to take a guess? What's the regular pattern? Which pictures are from the new place? Which pictures are from the old place? Um, how about over here? The old ones are always on the left, and the new ones are on the right. Maybe. Anybody else want to make a? Trees. 
I was, yeah, I was going to say the larger trees. Well, one of the things I didn't tell you is that the developer uh, of Ion actually did retain where he could the original <laughs> live oaks. So you can't use the vegetation exactly. So, okay? Anybody else want to make, a, make another guess? Or confirm? Or? Two dive more new. Top left and bottom right. Okay. Any, any other guesses? Anyone want to take a stab? Okay, right here. Last one. They're all Ion. No. No, no, no. Definitely not a trick in that case. Um, so actually, the, the, uh, the woman in the back, the first guess was actually correct. So the, uh, the column on the right is Ion, the new place. The column on the left is just a column. But from everybody's responses, you should certainly get a sense that we're pretty darn close um, in, in a way that's kind of amazing. You would never be able to actually have these places built for you to do this kind of a study. Um, and so what I discovered pretty quickly um, is a, a phenomenon that I ended up calling spontaneous fantasy. And the way I discovered this is that, again, I wanted to understand what were people's emotional reaction to these two places, the new and the old place. Um, I was really interested in, in this concept that we call place attachment environmental psychology, emotional attachment to place. And so what I did is I gave people uh, disposable cameras in both locations, and I asked them as they walked around and experienced their neighborhood, they had to walk, driving a car wasn't uh, uh, permissible, that they just take pictures of anything meaningful in their environment that's particularly meaningful to them. And so after they took those pictures, they sent the camera back to me, I developed the film, and then I interviewed them. And what they did during the interview is they essentially told me the story of the reasons why they were taking this photograph. But more importantly, what was actually happening in their mind, what they were thinking, what they were feeling as they were taking these pictures. And it was really quickly after I hit the first like five or so interviews that something was really apparent in Ion, I start Charleston, but not Ion. People were telling me stories like uh, this gentleman here who was describing as he was holding a camera up and taking a picture of these uh, stairs. This is a piece of a war building in Start Charleston. He said that he saw, in his mind's eye, Civil War soldiers marching up those steps. And in a similar example, this gentleman took a photograph, he actually was getting real down low to get this angle, of these ruts and this, these flagstones in an alley in the back of the store Charleston. And he also said that as he was holding his camera up in his mind's eye, he was seeing a vision of cotton wagons going down this path to some cotton warehouse in the distance. Now, on all of these stories that I've been told, the people were very clear to tell me that they had no idea if objectively, factually, any of these events ever happened. They were also very clear as they were describing these experiences that this was not daydreaming. You know, daydreaming, you, can, you, you will yourself to imagine a scene and change it. This happened to people like that. The environment stimulated it, image in your mind, not a whole lot of control over it. So it's premeditated, it's spontaneous, it's kind of like a fantasy. So I thought spontaneous fantasy kind of describes it pretty well. And what I was able to establish, I'm not going to go into a lot of the statistical details, but I started this as a qualitative study, and then I used statistical analysis to actually generalize to the two populations, one in Ion and the other in Stuart Charleston. Um, if the whole population, the whole residential population of these two places experienced them in the same way. And I was able also to establish a correlation uh, between experiences that people were having, having in this emotional place attachment. So what I was able to establish is that when people only in Stuart Charleston, this did not happen in Ion, when they experienced this patina that was part of their environment that they were walking around in, they had this spontaneous fantasy, lots of different variations on this. And when they did, they reported increased emotional attachment to this neighborhood. Not only in terms of depth, depth, but in terms of complexity of character. So things like there was a higher level of rootedness that I was able to measure to the people living in historic Charleston versus Ion. Higher level of uh, place substitutability for people in Ion versus Historic Charleston, which kind of makes sense. And so really interesting phenomenon seems to be happening here that's really related to patina and age of place. And as far as I know, 
no one has done this kind of work. And it needs to be built upon. <laughs> and so those of you who might be interested, you know, if you already have an academic career or you're interested in going forward, this kind of primary research, I think, is really important to help us understand why people like old places. Let's stop guessing, and why don't we actually come up with some evidence? Because I think it, again, makes it really powerful in terms of what we should be doing, especially managing the types of changes in uh, built environments. Now, some other people have definitely been doing some work uh, in the realm of environmental psychology, and, and I'm increasingly calling this um, heritage behavior research, kind of to build on what we, the phrase we use in environment and behavior design. Um, one of the things that um, we use really frequently in environment behavior research um, as a lot of these case studies, um, one of the more well-researched areas is that if you have a hospital room and you have a view to nature out the hospital room or just simply a view out a window, uh, patients actually recover more quickly in that room, believe it or not. They also uh, uh, exhibit lower levels of pain. So the design of a hospital room and views in nature huge impacts um, in terms of patient recovery. Um, something similar seems to be happening with heritage objects. So um, in England, Anders and a group of researchers, they went into a hospital and they brought patients in the hospital room ancient objects. So this is England and they, they gave people uh, authentic, real Roman artifacts, coins and little ceramic pieces. And they had the people in the hospital room hold these objects um, and look at them and experience them. And then they had a control group, similar kinds of patients, similar kinds of room that were, were just given random objects uh, with no heritage value associated with it. So what this group was able to establish is that the people who were holding the heritage objects reported lower levels of pain and higher levels of well-being. They didn't actually go as far as trying to determine if they actually recovered more quickly, but we actually have at least a glimmer of some evidence that there actually may be some therapeutic effects to heritage. I think this is really, really fascinating. We know on a more sort of a sociological, cultural basis that simply being able to participate in heritage processes, this might be a Main Street program, it might be community-based archaeology, uh, this is what Sayer looked at, but participation in heritage processes bonds us with our communities and our places. It really is important, uh, not only in terms of identity, but in situating us uh, in terms of importance and feeling like we're an important member of society, um, that uh, just participating in this is a useful, certainly useful. Melinda Milligan did some work um, uh, a while back on, uh, she was interested in how historic homeowners related to and understood their houses. And so she, she did quite a few interviews of people and one of the things that she uh, established was that owners of historic homes um, anthropomorphize them, turn them into living creatures. They talked about their houses as if they had to be you know, fed and taken care of, you know, kind of like a pet in a way, um, and you could hurt them. Um, but it also had a lot to do with how uh, the owners of these kinds of homes, their identity and how they derive their identity from that relationship with the house. Now, one of the more recent areas of research in terms of people and heritage and place and that, that connection uh, from an emotional and psychological standpoint is happening in the in area of heritage tourism and museum studies. And I'll explain a couple of studies here. Uh, Drew and Crofts try to answer the question, you know, what, what do heritage tourists really want in terms of an experience of, of you know, the place that they're going to visit? Um, one of the things that they looked at in the interviews that they did of people was that people are not looking for some sort of scientific accuracy or being told facts, um, not really going to these places to learn, more or less. But they're going there to, and that's um, Joel Cross's phrase, they're there to experience a new reality catalyzed by this historic place. And if this sounds a little bit like spontaneous fantasies, it certainly seems to be related. People seem to want to go to heritage places for sort of some sort of creative catalyst of something new and experience of something that's new. Smith and Campbell, and Laura Jane Smith is doing much more work on this. Um, she's got massive amounts of data. Um, over 20 years, she interviewed 3,500 people. That just sounds absolutely exhausting. At, at heritage sites in the United States and Australia and uh, Canada and the United Kingdom. 
so many interviews that you can start to see, even though the research is qualitative, um, you know, you can probably start generalizing uh, from the results. So, but what she has come to the conclusion is that people are not going to museums and heritage places to learn, again, kind of reinforcing what some other researchers have been saying. They're going there to feel and to experience. Moreover, she has lots of evidence that many people go to heritage sites for sort of a cathartic experience. So she has a great example of why uh, some people um, went to uh, a uh, civil uh, rights museum because uh, this African-American mother used it to interpret her experience going through the civil rights movements to her child um, in, in a way that was incredibly emotionally uh, wrenching. Um, I, I mean, I'm not going to try and replicate uh, what's in the study, but these cathartic events seem to have a lot of reasons why people go to places. Um, this is an interesting challenge to our field of historic preservation because the way we're supposed to be interpreting places is objectively, factually, people are supposed to be learning. We are educators. What do we do with this kind of evidence? This is an open question, and I think there's, there's a lot more discussion. So. Let's get a pretty quick overview of some of this research linking people in place and personal experiences in environmental psychology. And if you're interested in more of this, um, I really encourage you to take a look at some of the work that's happening at the Environmental Design Research Association. And this is a new plug I'm giving because I'm, I'm currently the chair. Um, our next speaker, Mimi Nerian, is also a member of EDRA. Um, and this is really the only organization they know where this kind of research is happening and where you're going to encounter some of these researchers that do work in environmental psychology and the historic environment. And there's a, a network area that does work in there. Um, I mean, there's a website address that you can go to. Um, and I certainly encourage you, you know, sort of come talk to me after this um, or give me an email. Love to talk with you more about any of this kind of research.